Rosine Origins, the tragic child who thought she was an elf and became an apostle instead, explored. When the Golden Age arc came to a conclusion, we personally were extremely curious to see how Miura would handle the time skip. Berserk technically began two years after the eclipse, but the Black Swordsman arc was peak edgelord guts. He had absolutely no time for anyone else, and his remorse, while present, was depicted only briefly. The Golden Age arc gave us so much to connect with guts on an emotional level that when we read chapter 95, we could tell this was not the same guts that was debuted in 1989. So how do we establish him in that same light? By making his first comeback hunt against a literal child apostle. The Lost Children mini arc is one of the most disturbing arcs in all of Berserk, and the subject of this video is pretty much the reason why. Rosine actually debuted in the Golden Age arc when she and the Slug Count cornered Rickard, and were about to deprive us of the greatest slap in manga history. But thanks to Skull Knight, Ricky lived on. Unfortunately, the same was true for Rosine, and now we'll explain why there's such a huge difference between Puck and the Elves of Misty Valley. So without further ado, this is Rosine's Origins explored. Before we get into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. A wayward glutton en route to an inhuman feast. Rosine's introduction to Berserk. From the moment we saw Guts in Coca to the moment Griffith was thrown into the Tower of Rebirth, we only saw one elf in the story of Berserk, and that was Puck. Puck met Guts in the first chapter of Kentaro Miura's masterpiece, and he's been a constant bug in his ear and his resident healer ever since. In fact, we think Puck might have been introduced to the story even before that, because when Judo gives Casca elf dust for the Hundred Man Slayer, the description of the troop he gets it from is similar to the one Rickert travels with to the point of the eclipse. And speaking of the eclipse, that is where we see Rosine first, or rather, in the build-up to it, and it's immediately clear that she is anything but an elf. The cover of Chapter 51 of Berserk, titled Festival's Eve Part 1, is where Rosine is first seen, but her first canonical appearance is within the chapter itself. After Guts and Co. start making their way into the Tower of Rebirth with Princess Charlotte and a reluctant Anna in tow, the scene cuts to a stream somewhere within the dense woods of Midland. The Band of the Falcons Reserve Unit, which was ordered to rendezvous with the rescue unit at the border, was resting up, and for once, in high spirits. Even as they lay wounded, burning with fever, and held together by stitches, the wings of the falcon were eager to flutter again. Rickert was the one who made note of this for us with his inner monologue as he went to fetch a pail of water for his wounded comrade. But it was then that everything changed. As the youngest member of the Band of the Falcon, Rickert was still young impressionable and innocent. So when he saw a glowing visage form above the stream and zoom past him on butterfly wings, he immediately assumed it was an elf. He dropped his water in his shock, but he would never get a chance to fill it back up again because it was right after this that Rickert heard the screams of his fellow falcons. He rushed to the campsite anticipating an enemy raid, but all he found was the darkness lit dimly by scattered campfires. His eyes adjusted to the upside down figure of Kim, begging him to run, but it was too late already. The reason and Kim was upside down was because he was currently in the process of being devoured by the Slug Count, who had teamed up with Rosine and her pseudo-apostles for a little snack before the big meal. The Apostle herself was mostly focused on cornering Rickard for her comrades, as she showed up on the tree before him as the young Falcon started backing away. She motioned for her insectoid pseudos to attack Rickard and finish the snack when the Skull Knight showed up to save the day. He told off the Count and Rosine for indulging themselves when haste was needed, and the pair knowing his power, didn't disagree with him. Rosine did blow a raspberry at the Skull Knight before flying off into the eclipse, but this is how she was introduced to the world of Berserk. The interesting thing to note here is that Rickard didn't think she was a monster initially. He thought she was an elf, mostly because of her appearance, and that is a crucial detail. Because elves are central to understanding how this child became one of the worst abominations known to mankind. Guts saves one girl from a monster, but ends up having to face another who is a monster. The Elves of the Misty Valley. If you've been with us so far in this video, first of all, thank you. Please like and subscribe and comment down below. But you'll also have noticed that we called Rosine anything but an elf in the previous section. And that isn't because she's different from Puck in how she looks. We meet Ivalira later on in the tale, and she belongs to the same species as Puck. Their sizes, appearance, even mannerisms match quite a bit, though they will deny this to each other. The word elf 
could be applied to the little critters that attack those thugs bothering Jill underneath a cursed tree, but not Rosine herself. From her one appearance, we can clearly see that she used to be a human of short stature, most likely a child given that she blew a raspberry at the Skull Knight, the only person who possibly carries more apostles in his body bag than Guts. But another curious thing to note was that this appearance seems to have been her base form. Most apostles simply appear human in their base forms. Sure, they have exaggerated, borderline demonic features that set them apart as apostles, but they ultimately appear human for the most part. When Rosine shows up for the first time, she looks like an elf, and when we see her elves for the first time, the resemblance is clear enough for us to tell they belong to her. What we don't realize is that this is just their base form. We learn this fact when we get to Jill's village, and this is where things start to remind us of the Black Swordsman arc. We knew Jill's story was going to be traumatic when, instead of thanking Puck for saving her from a tree monster, she fell to her knees in fear. But we could only truly understand when we saw the reason for her terror with our own eyes. Jill wanted to thank the Black Swordsman for saving her life, so she took him to her village for a bit of R&R. But the first thing Guts noticed was how run down everything was. The streets were about as deserted as the villages he would later find Isidro and Yzma at, except this one actually had human beings living inside every house. For some reason, they were just scared to come outside. And to make matters worse, they really didn't like elves. Things were still relatively fine when Jill's drunkard former soldier of a father started making a scene upon her return, but they took a turn for the worse when Puck tried to defend her with his bloody needle technique and ended up being screamed at. The mood of the entire village changed from desolate and fearful to apprehensive and hostile, as Guts asked Puck if his kind swarmed and ate crops as a prank as well. Puck vehemently denied this accusation, but the villagers were not willing to compromise. They charged at Guts, and the black swordsman unintentionally ended up knocking an old woman over in self-defense as she muttered on about wanting her grandson back. Now properly agitated, the people from Jill's village charged Guts, and he ended up having to destroy a water carriage in order to make a safe escape. The defiant girl still found him and gave him a safe location to squat at, but that didn't answer the black swordsman's questions, and he had a lot of them. Like, why did her village kinfolk hate elves so much? What had happened to that old woman's grandson? And most of all, what and where in the heck was Misty Valley? He was granted his answers when he woke up after a night of fighting off the malign spirits of the dead and found Jill sleeping in his lap, a basket of food kept beside her. She told him that it was a valley that lay to the east of her village and had gotten its name because of a mysterious mist that hung about it all year round. Jill told Guts and Puck that a long time ago, elves populated the Misty Valley, and this makes the latter drool with a sense of longing. But it also makes him wonder why the people of her village treated him with such contempt, because elves were supposed to be adored in backwater areas like this one. His words, not ours. He asks Jill why everyone got that tense, murderous look on their faces when they laid eyes upon him and if some event caused it to happen. Guts mockingly ventured to guess that a weird swarm might have gone off, causing more mischief than usual, and to his shock, Jill agreed. Apparently, for a few years now, the villages around the Misty Valley were being attacked by elves, whose description seems identical to Puck's. They've been destroying crops and livestock as well, and everyone who manages to spot them agrees that they look like the elves from the fairy tales. But there is one big distinction between them and Puck. They eat humans. Well, two distinctions, because these elves also apparently take children along with them when they attack a village. This answers most of the questions that both Guts and we as the audience had with regards to the legend of the Misty Valley. But what about the mysterious elves who lived there? Were they just an extra aggressive offshoot of regular elves, or were they something else entirely? Well, that question was answered when a whole storm of them passed by the windmill Guts was taking shelter in, and his brand started bleeding. The black swordsman instinctively knew that these creatures were pseudo-apostles at the very least, and grinned wickedly at the prospect of killing them. When Guts and Puck arrived in Jill's village, it was already under attack. A dog, some cows, and a family had been devoured by these Misty Valley elves who were now trying to carry their surviving child off with them. Before they could do this, however, Guts arrived and managed to save the child. He asked the kid if he wanted to live or go away with the monsters, and when he replied with the latter option, Guts proceeded to use him as bait. The black swordsman put the child on the tip of his massive dragon slayer and ran away from the spot he was at as quickly as he could, drawing every elf into a nearby barn so he could trap them all. Once they caught up with him and realized that the chase was over, the insectoid elves, who looked nothing like Puck already, 
transformed into their actual pseudo-apostle states, which closely resembled wasps and murder hornets. Guts continued swatting the bugs out of the air before spilling gunpowder across the barn's floor and setting it alight with his arm cannon. He commends the child he used in his scheme for being good bait, and makes him watch the pseudo-apostles die to instill the image in his head. But his soliloquy on bugs is cut short when a massive she-elf arrives to the scene, and she looks different from all of her hellspawn, pun very much intended. From the back, she looks like a majestic luna moth with pale green wings and a beautiful aura surrounding her very person. But the stinger embedded in her spine and those black eyes remind you that this is, in fact, not an elf, this is an apostle. The queen elf asks Guts how he became as strong as he is for a human like him, and the black swordsman replied by calling her insect scourge. This annoyed the queen, who asked her subjects what she should do with him. All of them unanimously agreed that they should get Guts, but there was something very odd about the way they said it. It was almost as if these elves were actually children, and that fear was confirmed for us by Puck, who tried stopping Guts from killing any of them before he knew what he was about to do. He was a second too late, because the black swordsman had already squared up to the elfin apostle and was poised to strike at the opportune moment. Guts brought Dragonslayer down at an advancing Rosine, fully expecting to make lethal contact. So you can imagine his shock when he not only missed, but got counterattacked as well, all within an instant. It was too quick for Guts, who was arguably at peak physical condition, to keep up with the Queen Elf's movements, and she managed to sting his left arm and left him reeling on his feet. The female apostle began mocking Guts by blowing raspberries at him, but before the black swordsman could reply in his own fashion, he was stopped by Puck, who told him that these elves were actually human children. It makes sense when you think about how the elves and their moth-like mother both behave around adults and this fact was solidified for us when the Apostle lunged at Puck for interacting with Guts as an elf, calling him Peacalf the Outcast, and stopped short upon seeing Jill protecting the fallen swordsman. Peacalf the Outcast was a popular folktale from Jill's village, and the only reason she was able to stop the advance of a full-blown Apostle with no intentions to slow down their assault was because she knew her. This Apostle was her childhood friend, Rosine. Despite having become a demonic elfin figure whose spawn devoured humans for flesh and fun, Rosine was able to recognize recognize her friend Jill, and called off the attack. Soon after her departure, Guts fell to the ground, near paralyzed from the poisonous dust Rosine's sting had introduced to his body, but his fight was far from over. The angry and anxious villagers rushed to the site of the burning barn and found a horror scene waiting for them. Dozens of their stolen youth lay in front of their eyes, burnt to a crisp, and naturally they blamed Guts for this misfortune. He thought quick and used Jill as a hostage to get out of his predicament, and after getting a safe distance away from the village, he let her go. Jill wanted to continue on with him, but Guts reminded her that he was going to kill that very friend she wanted to see. Her life wouldn't be safer or any less traumatic than it already was if she decided to go with him, and so he set out by himself. Jill followed him nonetheless, because she knew he was headed to the Misty Valley, and she had to find out what happened to her friend all those years ago that she would now return as an apostle. The answer was deeply tragic, but not uncommon amongst those who tend to ascend to demon kind. A peacalf of legend, a peacalf from real life. How Rosine became an apostle. Puck and his new companion caught up with Guts as he was in the middle of slaying the ghosts of the children he had killed as pseudo-apostles. The black swordsman was lost in his murderous trance and was not paying attention to much of anything until Jill caught his eye. Despite being poisoned, stabbed, and jacked up from the cocoa leaves he consumed to stay up all night, Guts protects the girl and breaks her fall off a cliff. When both of them come to, he asks her why she followed him, and when she doesn't get that answer, Answer, he asks her about Peacalf. That's when we learn of a rural legend of Jill's village. Long ago, there lived a boy with red eyes and pointed ears. His name was Peacalf, but his peers often bullied him by calling him Red-Eyed Peacalf or Pointy-Eared Peacalf because of his appearance. Despite being loved immensely by his parents, Peacalf was made to feel like an outcast, like he didn't belong in his own village, so he resolved to go find the place that was his by himself. After searching for a long time, Peacalf finally found the elves who dwelt in the fabled Misty Valley and asked them to add him to their community, because they looked so much alike. Alas, Peacalf was rejected by the elves as well, because he technically wasn't one of them. He was a human with elfin features. When Peacalf was extremely young, he fell sick, and his parents broke village taboo to bring him to the Misty Valley and seek the elves' help in restoring his health. The ritual succeeded, but it gave Peacalf distinct elfin traits like pointy ears and red eyes. As a result, he would never be the same as other children, but his parents didn't care. They were grateful for his survival, and that's 
that's when Peacalf realized how loved he had actually been in life. He rushed back home to his loving parents, but in his zeal to find himself, he hadn't realized just how much time had passed in the outside world. Time flowed differently in the Misty Valley, and so it was that what felt like minutes to Peacalf was actually decades in the real world. His parents were long gone, lost to the sands of time and sickness, and a homeless Peacalf sat and cried his eyes raw on a hill now that he had truly nowhere to go. Guts calls it a pretty terrible story, but Jill informs him it was Rosine's favorite. She was the one who taught Jill about Peacalf, but she would often take it a step further and claim she was Peacalf herself, which is where we start to understand the reason behind Rosine's ascension. Jill reveals that during her youth, she would often play with Rosine in the woods until the sun came down, and sometimes well after that. As an only child, Jill thought of Rosine, four years her elder, as the sister she never had. Rosine initially felt like a tomboy to her because she would do boyish things, like exploring the woods, playing with snakes, and collecting all sorts of junk and trinkets, out of which her favorite was a strange stone with a misshapen face on it. Rosine told Jill she had just found it at the riverbank one day and kept it, but from the way that she took care of it, it was evident to anyone who knew her that that stone was special. It's only when Puck gives Jill a peep at Becky that we get the confirmation that Rosine had actually picked up a behelet. At first, Jill thought her and Rosine would spend a lot of time together because the older girl genuinely loved her company. It became clear to her later in life that while Rosine did love her, the reason behind their escapades was the abuse she faced at home. A long time ago, Jill's village was caught up in the tide of war, and Rosine's mother was one of the women who suffered the indignity of being violated by bloodthirsty troops. As a result of this, Rosine's father was never quite sure whether she was his daughter or not, and would often take out his anger on both wife and daughter. It was when Rosine would come to Jill bearing the bruises of her father's abuse that she would bring up Peacalf's story. But the future apostle always added a little twist to it. Everyone else knew that the legend of Peacalf is just that, a legend. But to Rosine, there is nothing more true than that story, and in her mind, after facing a particularly harrowing session of physical abuse from her father, the ending of that legend is very different. For Rosine, Peacalf never left the Misty Valley because, in her version, he really was an elf, who ended up shifting there with his parents and living happily ever after. And if she was to tell Jill the complete truth, then Rosine herself was a lot like Peacalf, and she truly thought she belonged in the Misty Valley as well. Whenever she would recount this version of the story to Jill, Rosine would have a weird smile plastered across her face, like she was forcing herself to be happy. And then, a few months later, even that illusion vanished when Rosine decided to run away from home for good. It was on a stormy, rainy night that she threw a stone at Jill's bedroom window and told her, sort of maniacally, that she was now going to be with her kind in the Misty Valley. Rosine left Jill with all of her worldly possessions and took only her behelet with her, which the latter girl realized after her parents disappeared from the village too. And this is when Guts explains to the girl what a behelet really is. The black swordsman uses his crass vocabulary and blunt speech to scare some sense into Jill, who seemed intent on following him no matter the circumstance, by telling her how the behelet functions and what her friend has now become. He throws in the fact that Rosine probably used her parents as a sacrifice to deter Jill, but something about her old friend's maniacal smile the night she left for the Misty Valley kept her on Guts's heels. So when the black swordsman left her and Puck behind, Rosine came for her instead. She used her childhood connection with Jill and and her flamboyant apostle wings to woo the girl into coming with her to the Misty Valley, even holding her pseudos back from attacking Guts, just because her friend asked her to. When Rosine and Jill were flying through the sky, the latter felt bigger than she ever had, gazing down upon her village which looked like an ant from this distance, and if it hadn't been for Puck's intervention, Jill would have probably ended up like one of Rosine's many elves. Rosine pulled out all the stops to get her friend to become one of them. Flower tiaras, special treatment from her minions, massive insectoid guardians, the whole shebang. But when Jill saw her idea of fun included having her own minions play at war like adults do, the charm wore off rather quickly. Don't blame us for not giving you a trigger warning right now, because if you google adult attack berserk, the images you're going to see will stay with you for life, and not in a good way. It was only after Jill saw those images in real time that she snapped out of it and made a break for it. Puck and Jill blitzed through the misty valley with murderous elves chasing them before they rejected eating one of their fallen ilk. Gross we know, but not as gross as Rosine manipulating Jill to become an extra special elf at the emergence grounds, after she had seen just how unstable the whole cocoon rebirth situation really was. Puck tried to make Jill snap out of Rosine's trance and was called Peacalf and nearly killed for it. We say nearly because just as the Hornet Elves closed in on Puck, Guts arrived and set the emergence grounds ablaze. The Black Swords 
Jasmine engaged in a vicious battle with the elf-like apostle and her many minions, emerging as more of a monster than any of them in Jill's eyes. But that thought lasts only until Rosine transforms into her true apostle state. Yes, you heard us right. The elf form Rosine used to fly around so far wasn't even her actual full transformation. Rosine belongs to a special group of apostles whose base forms are entirely non-human. The other two are the egg-shaped apostle and the Bakiraka clan exile called Rakshas. Despite having wildly different appearances in both base and demonic release forms, all three of these apostles share one trait in common in our opinion. They all rejected their human selves. The egg-shaped apostle candidly speaks to Luca about his transformation, and Rakshas' origins, like his motives, remain cryptic as ever. Rosine's reason for being the way she is in her base form essentially comes down to her believing that she was an elf in order to escape the traumatic bonds of her human life. If you've read the Lost Children arc of Berserk, then you will have noticed that Rosine often ridicules humans, especially adults, as being fearful manipulators who don't know a single thing about having fun. But deep down, she knows that her desperation to be recognized as an elf was nothing more than an attempt to find a place where she belonged. After transforming, Rosine and Guts have a one-on-one -on -one confrontation that is perhaps the greatest test of the Black Swordsman's fighting skills up to this point. In her released state, Rosine could literally break the sound barrier with her flying speed, which took the difficulty level of even trying to reach her from improbable to impossible. Guts ended up pulling a Teresia with Jill and used her to lure Rosine into a vulnerable position. He then drove his sword through her, and she took him into the night sky with her in her blinding rage and pain. Rosine whipped Guts off her back and thought she'd won when her stinger skewered his face mid-air, but the black swordsman had evaded the blow by taking it on his jaw, and he used the leverage his mouth provided to slash right through Rosine. As the apostle fell through the sky, she recalled the moment she first arrived in the Misty Valley, and this is when we learn the full truth of her transformation. Rosine knew that the valley never had elves in it at all. She was a dreamy girl, yes, but that was out of necessity. Deep down, she was just as realistic as a priest of the Holy See, and she knew, in her heart, of hearts that elves didn't exist. Yet, as a means of rejecting her tormented human existence, she sought them out, and when she got there, she waited for days on end to catch a glimpse of a single elf. If they really did exist, the elves did not show themselves to Rosine, but her parents did. Rosine's mother and father had come all the way to the Misty Valley to look for her, and while she was delighted to see the former, it was the latter who triggered her ascension. Her father immediately began beating her up and berating her for being such a troublesome child. In his rage, he even pushed Rosine's mother off of himself hard and caused her to bleed with a slap. In that moment, the girl rejected the world and everything that came with it, giving in to her despair. A drop of blood spilt on her behelet activated it and summoned the God Hand, who granted her wish of becoming an elf by taking the people whom she held dearest as sacrifices, her parents. Rosine's life might have been pockmarked with extreme familial abuse, but she did love her family, and in their quieter moments, nothing made her happier than the love her father and mother shared for one another. But in that moment of despair, none of it mattered, and she became the apostle we have been talking about for over 20 minutes now. In her dying moments, Rosine's beliefs were validated by Puck, who told her that the cedar tree of the Misty Valley was like a spirit tree, which meant elves really did live in the Misty Valley at some point. Guts took a final swing at the dying apostle, but Rosine managed to fly away at the last moment. As she took her last flight, she thought back to the good days of her youth, and made her peace with the fact that she will see her parents in the afterlife, even if that meant the eternal abyss that is Berserk's hell. Marvelous Verdict. And that's it for this video. Rosine is the prime example of how kids never quite know what is right from wrong, and it's our duty to teach them at every step of the way, especially early on. If only her father had not disciplined her so harshly, none of this would have happened. But it also shows you that clinging on to a childish dream will, more often than not, lead to disappointment. Rosine knew elves didn't exist, and yet she was crushed when she didn't find them in the Misty Valley. She knew she was a monster herself, yet she insisted on taking Jill with her everywhere, because she was the only person who had ever given her the positive reinforcement and love that a growing child needs. Rosine is a case study in how neglecting and abusing kids can lead to horrifying circumstances. We should be thankful that behelots don't exist in the real world, because who knows how many other children would be out there adult attacking each other in the name of fun and games. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. This has been Corey Whelan for Marvelous Videos. Have a good one, be safe out there, and thanks for watching.